some of you are still here from my first talk, and I have to say, well done. I hope you're not sick of me after two hours worth of me. Um, and it's great to see you guys back again for my three o'clock talk. And um, for this talk, I'm going to be focusing on diabetes. Diabetes, it's a really common problem, and uh, that's what I've been asked to talk about in this slot. And I don't think a lot of people realize that it's actually possible um, to slow down the progression, um, to halt and even to reverse type 2 diabetes through lifestyle changes. Um, and why is this important? Because it's a really big problem and it's growing. We've got 3.7 million people nearly living with diabetes in the UK now, and there's about a million extra people just walking around with diabetes and they don't even know it. Um, and then we've got 12.3 million people at risk of diabetes with so-called pre-diabetes. Um, and the reason that this is so crucially important is because when you have diabetes, um, you have an 80% chance of dying of a heart attack or a stroke before your time. Not only that, but you're at risk of many complications. Um, reduced sight, potential blindness, impotence, uh, peripheral vascular disease, having to have limbs amputated, gastrointestinal disturbances. You know, it's a really nasty disease. And uh, this picture represents peripheral neuropathy, which can either lead to numbness or in some cases severe intractable pain which is very difficult to treat once you get it and so this is a serious problem and we need to do something about it and what do we normally do about it we normally try to medicate well that's what doctors do anyway we do our best we we think okay let's try and control things let's try and slow things down let's control the blood sugars and we give a variety of medications to attempt to stem the flow of the disease, as it were. We try and sort of stop it in its tracks, but what we're really doing is, is just slowing things down and sometimes we're causing harm as well. Uh, and what do people with diabetes do? Well, they try anything they can to potentially try and fix the problem themselves. They may try uh, low carbohydrate diets. They may, may try ketogenic diets and they may try starvation, uh, and what they tend to find sometimes is that they'll be yo-yo dieting and often putting more weight on than when they started and getting incredibly frustrated in the process. Um, but what if I told you that there was potentially another way of dealing with this? What if I told you that there was a way that with lifestyle medicine and lifestyle changes that you can make yourselves if you're type 1 diabetic, you have the potential for a normal lifespan. If you're type 1 diabetic, you could potentially reduce your insulin needs by two thirds. And if you're living with type 2 diabetes, what if I told you that there is a chance that using these lifestyle um, recommendations, using plant-based nutrition, you could potentially reduce your oral medications in half within a week or two of these changes. That's how fast your insulin sensitivity will shoot up. And if you stick with it and you're already having to have insulin because your disease has progressed, there is a very good chance you could come off your insulin. And if you stick with it for six months or more, there is a really good chance that you could come off all your medications completely. That is the power of plants. So, just sharing a little bit about myself, for those of you who weren't here earlier on today, my name is Dr Gemma Newman, I'm a GP, I'm a senior partner at an NHS surgery near Heathrow Airport, and I have seen some incredible, some life-changing results for people um, using plant-based nutrition. But it wasn't always this way. Uh, previously, I was quite resistant to change. This is a picture of me a few years back, on the, well, they're actually both me, um, as you could probably tell, but the one on the left, um, I was obese and um, I was a size 18, and I enjoyed what I enjoyed. I didn't really think much about food and nutrition, so I decided to do something about it, and I lost a lot of weight. I exercised every day. I had a generally low carbohydrate approach to my weight loss, and I managed to go from a size 18 to a size 8. I was very pleased about that, of course, you know, I was feeling good, looking good, but 
The downside was I still had a raised cholesterol and a raised lipid profile. And this was a problem for me because I do have a strong family history of heart disease. I've got relatives that have died suddenly from heart attacks. Uh, these are slim people, uh, you know, people that, that um, you know, they weren't obese, they didn't have other risk factors. So I knew that despite my best efforts, I was not going to be able to achieve what I would ho was hoping to achieve through my lifestyle changes. And for a while I was just despondent about that and just thought, oh, well, never mind, that's my genetic fate, that's just my life. But I began to do some research and what I realised over time, the more I researched this, was that there was another way. Um, the research of Dr. Dean Ornish, uh, Dr. Cobble Esselstyn, Dr. Garth Davis, Dr. Michael Greger, these are a few of many doctors who have been able to uncover a lot of the research over the last 80 years or more to show that a plant-based approach to nutrition has profound effects on what we can achieve with the power of our plate. Needless to say, I decided to take my own advice on this and I adopted a plant-based diet. Within around a month of doing that, I was able to show completely normal, healthy lipid profiles. And this is many years later, two kids later, half the amount of exercise later. It's possible to do this through these dietary changes. And that obviously had me hooked, but um, uh, yeah, I think many of you hopefully will have similar stories if you've come at it for a period of health rather than anything else. Um, so what this talk is going to do really is it's going to cover three aspects. First of all, I'm going to talk about uh, what is diabetes, how does it happen? Secondly, I'm going to talk about some of the diets and um, food patterns that can harm us when we have diabetes. And lastly, I'm going to bring it all together and talk to you about how a whole food plant-based approach to nutrition is beneficial if you have diabetes. So first up, what are the causes? Now there are many causes of diabetes. Type 1 diabetes, as some of you will know, is um, genetic and also there's um, usually an environmental trigger. In type 2 diabetes, there is also a genetic link, and there are also lifestyle triggers. Now, there are so many things associated with diabetes, you know, poor sleep patterns, um, stress, shift pattern working, sedentary lifestyles, lack of exercise, um, even certain use of mouthwash can actually, believe it or not, predispose you to type 2 diabetes for other reasons. But today, because we're talking about plant-based nutrition, because we're at VegFest, obviously I'm going to be talking to you about the nutrition aspect of why diabetes happens. So, oh, it's got a bit darker. Can you still see that, everybody? Yeah, just about. Um, so what about type 1 diabetes? Now, I mentioned that there was a genetic link to that. But around 90% of people with a genetic predisposition don't actually end up with type 1 diabetes. There has to be an environmental trigger. And we don't always know what that trigger is. Um, but what happens with that is um, you have the trigger, then your own body starts to attack um, itself. It's an autoimmune disorder. So you begin to attack your own um, beta cells, your pancreatic beta cells, the ones that make insulin. Now, again, like I said, the triggers are many. Um, viral triggers are supposed to be one, but one that's come up in quite a few studies that I thought is worth mentioning today is that there's a few studies now to show an association between more cow's milk exposure and the development of type 1 diabetes in children. And the reason for that is thought to be because the, ser uh, the serum bovine albumin and the beta casein proteins look very similar in terms of their structure to your pancreatic beta cells. So if you are going to develop a reaction to them, then, then that would partly go some way of explaining the link there. But what about type 2 diabetes? People always say um, it's the carbs, it's the sugar. And unfortunately, they'd be wrong. Um, it's not the carbs. Having a high blood sugar is the outcome of type 2 diabetes, but it is not the underlying cause. One of the main underlying causes that we're going to talk about today is saturated fats, trans fats, um, and excess oils in the body. So not just ones that we eat, but the ones that we carry, because um, adipocytes or fat cells have a very similar effect. Um, they are toxic to the body. So just a little bit of a, a recap around what happens. Um, 
When you have a sugary meal or a meal with carbohydrates in it, you will have glucose in your bloodstream, which is a normal thing. It's the primary fuel source of the body. The glucose needs to get inside the cell to provide it with energy. But what happens is when you have type 2 diabetes, it can't happen. It gets stuck in the bloodstream. And why is that? It needs an invitation to get inside the cell. It can't just go there by itself. It needs to bind to insulin to get inside the cell. So the glucose binds to the insulin, and then the insulin has to bind to an insulin receptor on the cell surface membrane. So far, so good, except when the insulin receptor is clogged up. So what happens there is that the insulin key on this lock and key analogy can no longer work. So it doesn't matter how much you try and force the key in the lock, unfortunately the glucose stays in the bloodstream along with the insulin. And the reason that this clogging up happens is because of dietary fat and fat that spills into the bloodstream from adipose tissue, from fat tissue in our body as well. And the pancreas notices and the pancreas wants to do something about it. So it does the only thing it can do and it produces more insulin because there's excess blood sugar in the bloodstream. We need to get rid of it. It's toxic to your blood vessels and to your nerve endings. We've got to get rid of that glucose, use it. Um, but it doesn't matter how many new keys you make because if the insulin receptors are all clogged up, you're just going to end up with more sugar in the bloodstream and more insulin. You've got all these spare keys and they've got nothing to unlock. Uh, that is the basic mechanism by which dietary fats and fats within the bloodstream cause um, insulin resistance. And Yes, it's a lot to do with processed foods. It's a lot to do with um, trans fats from things like margarines. But the only natural source of trans fats is animal products. And it happens as well with saturated fats. And this is the biggest danger of having a diet that's very high in animal products. And it's not just um, the, um, the high fat diet. I've talked about the adipocytes. They spill out the extra fat, the free fatty acids into the bloodstream. And studies have now shown that you can have someone who is overweight or have someone who is obese and you can measure the amount of free fatty acids in their bloodstream. They will be higher than somebody who is a normal weight. But if someone has a high fat, low carb diet and they're thin, they will unfortunately still have high circulating fatty acids in the bloodstream. So they will still suffer from insulin resistance to a degree, even if they are slim and healthy because they're having a high fat, low carb diet. This causes damage to the mitochondria, inflammation inside the cells, and then further perpetuates insulin resistance. And then it's a vicious cycle that goes on and on and on. And when you look at um, fats in the lab and you, you try and see what they do, you can get saturated fats in the form of palmitate and you can get um, unsaturated fats in the form of oleate. So um, oleate is things like olives and um, avocados and um, nuts and seeds and you can put them in a petri dish with beta cells, pancreatic beta cells. These are the cells that make insulin and what do you find? You find that it's the palmitate that causes rapid destruction of the pancreatic beta cells the longer you leave them in the petri dish. So it's not even just about the receptor issue that I was telling you earlier, it's also about the destruction of the pancreatic cells themselves. So there's multiple reasons why this would happen. Fat cells and junk saturated fats we talked about. We talked about the fat spill effect, the clogging of the receptors. Also, dietary fats inhibit insulin function in the first place. So that's yet another mechanism whereby dietary fats have a direct influence on your ability to metabolize glucose, which is of course, as I said, our primary fuel. Um, so what do we do? What do we do about this? Well, what doctors try to do, as I mentioned before, is we try to give medications and we think, well, you know, it's okay. We've got, we've got these um, the medications that we can use to try and fix this problem. <coughs> Some of you might be familiar with the ACCORD study. Uh, this was a study which aimed to prove that tight blood sugar control through the use of medication was beneficial to diabetics. Unfortunately, the study had to be closed down 18 months early because of excess deaths 
in the cohort of people that had the best blood sugar control. The reason for that is because they had the highest amount of medications that they were being given to try to control their blood sugars. So this is a serious issue. You know, we, we can actually potentially cause harm with our medications rather than benefit the underlying cause. Um, and sulfur and our ureas are a really common medication that we give for people with diabetes. Uh, Glyclozide is probably um, what you might be familiar with if you have a relative with diabetes or if you're diabetic yourself. And glyclozide is, is useful because it brings your blood sugars down, but it forces the pancreas into excessive insulin production, which, if you're thinking about what I just told you with regard to the lock and key mechanism, is pretty useless when it comes to treating the root cause of diabetes. You're just making more keys, and they're not going to get inside the cell because of the jamming of the lock. So it doesn't help the underlying cause, unfortunately. Also, UK PDS data shows us that when you're on metformin and you're adding in glyclozide, on average it takes about three years for half of those patients to need yet another additional medication. And this is over and above what you'd expect for simply um, you know, pancreatic decline. And it's thought to be because of the medications that we are giving. So it's not by any means a quick fix. And of course, when things get really bad for type 2s, then they start on insulin. And when a type 2 diabetic starts on insulin, you know that they're not on the route to recovery because excess insulin, unfortunately, is associated with increased risk of atherosclerotic plaques in many studies. Um, not only that, but you get more hungry, of course. If you're more hungry, you're going to eat more of the foods that have got you in the mess that you're in, and that's not helpful either. Weight gain, again, is also associated with increased insulin resistance for the reason I said earlier, it's all those fat cells spilling the free fatty acids back out into the bloodstream, making things worse. And there is even, in some studies, an increased risk of cancer with these higher insulin levels. And let's not forget the role of IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor 1. This, in excess, is also associated with increased cancer risk. Now, what about type 1 diabetics? You know, I mentioned them before. They obviously will need insulin. They don't make any themselves. But what the type 1 diabetics will really need to do is optimize their insulin. The, little, the littlest they can have, the better, because the higher the risk of cancer and reduced longevity with the higher doses of insulin. So Let's briefly talk about the foods and the diets that can potentially harm you because we've already talked about the mechanisms of why this happens. And now we can talk about the foods and the diets that make it worse. You may have expected that I was going to talk a little bit about the high-fat, low-carb diet. The reason for that is because it's really popular. People lose weight. Uh, they lose qu weight quite fast. And so with weight loss, you've got less of a risk of diabetic complications and you've also got a lower circulating insulin because you don't have as much glucose in your diet so everything's looking better in terms of the numbers but there was a study published in the British Journal of Nutrition back in 2012 which showed us that in actual fact a high fat low carb diet is much more likely to stiffen your arteries it reduces the suppleness of your arteries all over the body especially in the peripheral parts of the body, the, um, the legs, and this is not a good idea if you want to reduce your risk of heart disease and stroke. Also, uh, the only study to directly compare a healthy high-fat, low-carb diet to a healthy high-carbohydrate diet showed that there was a definite lack of blood supply to the coronary arteries. These are the arteries that crown the heart, the ones that supply the heart with the blood that it needs to keep pumping. This is a serious issue. You also increase your long-term risk of heart disease and stroke by other mechanisms. So the bottom line is, if you're going for a high-fat, low-carb diet, it's really not a great idea long-term because what you'll find is, although in the short term, you're getting some fantastic results for weight loss, in the long term, you are increasing your underlying insulin resistance. So the next time you just really fancy having a sweet potato or a bowl of quinoa, you'll be very disappointed because your insulin sensitivity will have dropped dramatically and your insulin resistance will have risen. And then you'll say to yourself, oh, bad banana. It was that banana I ate. Look, my blood sugars have gone through the roof. I'm not going to eat bananas anymore. And you'll know from what I just told you that that is faulty logic. 
What about ketogenic diets? They're so popular, aren't they? Everybody loves a ketogenic diet. Ketogenic diets mean that you have the vast majority of what you're eating from fat. Um, around 30 grams of carbohydrates are allowed per day, less than 10% of the diet. You're going to be peeing on sticks to make sure you're still in ketosis. This is hard work. Um, the majority of what you're eating will be, for most people on a ketogenic diet, animal-based products. There'll be some green vegetables, there'll be some non-starchy vegetables. And in terms of fruits, it's really just berries, pretty much. Um, so what's good? What's good about a ketogenic diet? You lose weight quickly, you have a flatline blood glucose, flatline insulin levels, and we've talked already today about why that might be. Um, but also, some people seem to thrive on it. Um, there are some people talking about how they've managed to improve their autism and their mild cognitive decline. And so you think to yourself, well, why? Why would this be? When we know that this diet is so bad for insulin resistance, why would some people do so well on it in the short term? And the short term is the key here. The reason is because they've used a ketogenic diet to increase their mitochondrial flexibility. Now, the mitochondria are the powerhouse of the cell. They're also cell signalers. We really need them uh, in order to create energy inside our bodies. And when you have a ketogenic diet, you are activating the PGC1 alpha pathway. Now, what is this PGC1 alpha pathway? It's a way for mitochondria to make more of themselves, so basically to multiply. And it's also a way to clear out old uh, mitochondria, the ones that are not working very well. And so this is why in some people with a ketogenic diet, you'll see, oh, suddenly they feel a little bit better all of a sudden. And they think, oh, this is it. I need to live in ketosis for the rest of my life. But unfortunately, there are many other potential side effects which I'll come on to. But it got me thinking, how else could you potentially stimulate this PGC1 alpha pathway? It can't just be having loads of animal products, surely? No, it's really not. There are many, many ways to stimulate the PGC1 alpha pathway. The most effective way that I've read about is the fasting mimicking diet. This means that you don't have to do the intermittent fasting and you don't have to do the um, time-restricted feeding, although I think that is a good idea and I'll come on to that in a minute. The fasting mimicking diet is essentially a very low calorie vegan diet for around 800 calories a day for about five days in a row. And you can do that maybe once every few months to boost your mitochondrial flexibility to activate this PGC1 alpha pathway. Intermittent fasting also does it, but people find that quite difficult. Time restricted feeding, I think, is a really good way of doing it day to day. That means aiming to keep your food intake within around a 10 to 12 hour window each day if you can. So if you're a person that has breakfast at 7 a.m. for example, then aiming not to eat past 7 p.m. would be a basic tenant of the time restricted feeding principle. Um, but apparently the less time that you feed in, so if you can manage to do it in eight hours or 10 hours, that has even more of a benefit. What, what else can activate this pathway? Um, Curcumin, in the form of turmeric, can activate the same pathways. You have high-intensity interval training, HIIT training. That is a very strong PGC1-alpha activator. What about quercetin? Quercetin is found in red onions and broccoli and green tea, for example, and this will have the same effect. Resveratrol from red grapes and berries, pistachios and peanuts, will also have the same effect. And even cold plunges will have this effect. It will boost your mitochondria quickly. Basically, I think what I'm saying is we should all try and do a spa day really often because you've got the high intensity training, then you've got the cold plunges, and you're gonna have the green tea and some grapes. So basically, yeah, rather than doing keto, just go on a few spa days a year. That's my recommendation. Um, so if you are one of these people that have read about keto and you wanna try it yourself and you're vegan, I do just want to say, look, if you want to try it for short-term benefit, then fine. There are plenty of ways of doing a vegan keto diet. You've got loads of recipe books online, 
And I actually really like this Instagram account. It's by the Clumsy Vegan, and her husband loves the vegan keto diet. So she spends a lot of time doing some interesting recipes online. So if that's something that you're interested in, you can always follow her and see what you think. But from what I've read over the course of time, the healthiest approach to long-term health will have to be a whole food plant-based approach, minimizing your fat intake for the reasons that I have already explained to you. Even people that do well on keto or vegan keto, they find that you know, within six months, they've increased their risk of other chronic diseases. So please don't live in ketosis. I have talked at length online about why I think the ketogenic diet is harmful long-term. There's a couple of plant-based news videos, nine nutrition studies every keto dieter needs to read, and why I quit low-carb and went vegan. So um, check those out if you have time. If you, if you don't have time, just look at this list. If you can read it, there are so many complications. You've got the short-term complications of um, basically feeling quite grumpy and miserable and having bad breath and getting constipated and having brain fog. And, and then you've got the long-term complications, which are much more serious. Um, even things like cardiac arrhythmias. Young children who've had to live in ketosis for medical reasons because they had intractable epilepsy. Uh, unfortunately, there's five case studies of these poor children who have actually died as a result of their ketogenic diet because they developed um, acute pancreatitis or um, sudden cardiac death. So it's really not something to be taken lightly for that reason. So we have covered what causes diabetes. We've covered why certain diets can be harmful for diabetes. Now, my favorite part of the talk, we're going to talk about the whole food plant-based diet and how it can improve diabetes for you. And why does it work so well? You're essentially optimizing all of the healthy constructs of the human diet. You've got the greens, the beans, the fruits, the vegetables, the nuts, the seeds. Um, all of that stuff has very unique properties to ensure that you're getting every micronutrient without having excess macronutrients. Here is the whole food plant-based diet pyramid, which I really like. I think that's a beautiful picture because it shows you in real terms what a whole food plant-based diet can, can be composed of and gives you a very clear idea of the colour, the beauty of nature, the power of plants to heal you and the power of your plate. Why does it work? Well, one of the ways it works is that it makes you full more easily. If you compare the calorie density of different foods, maybe some of you have seen this slide before, but I do love it, you can see that oil doesn't give you very much fullness in your belly. Uh, neither does cheese, neither does meat. Potatoes, rice and beans fill you up nicely, but look at those fruit and veggies, you're completely stuffed. You'd have to eat an awful lot of those um, to, um, to fill up your tummy with the same amount of calories. Why else does it work? Because it's sustainable. Now, there is a medic in this room, in fact, that drew my attention to the Broad Study, which is a fantastic study that came out of New Zealand. It was done by GPs. And what I love about this study is that they just use diet alone. Many studies talk about how exercise improves outcomes. They talk about how caloric restriction improves outcomes. Uh, in fact, there was another recent study showing that diabetics get better when they're starved. Of course they get better. Of course they get better if they have these um, micronutrient shakes, but they can't sustain it. They don't want to live like that. Who wants to live like that? I certainly wouldn't. The beauty of a whole food plant-based diet is that you can maintain it, you can enjoy it. These, um, these menopausal ladies who are all overweight, they were told to eat a whole food plant-based diet and they managed to bring their weight down and keep their weight down without increasing their exercise and without restricting their caloric intake. So it's a very unique study in that regard. Check it out if you're interested. And another reason why it works, um, I mentioned this briefly in my last talk, so apologies for repetition if you've seen this before, but the Adventist health studies, I love them. The reason they're so good is because they have vegans, they have vegetarians, they have pescatarians, they have flexitarians, and they have non-vegetarians. And the only real difference between these groups is what they eat. On the whole, they look after themselves. They're all Seventh-day Adventists. They don't drink, they don't take drugs, they exercise, they keep active, they've got good social links. 
they've got a spiritual belief pattern, which are all associated with longevity, but they do differ a little bit in what they eat. And the whole food plant-based eaters have been shown in this large study of well over 60,000 people to be the only group of North Americans that not only managed to maintain a healthy weight, but also had a dramatically reduced risk of type 2 diabetes. The American prevalence of type 2 diabetes actually is, I think it's around 11% now. So you can tell from the fact that the non-vegetarian Adventists were healthy generally because their rate of diabetes was 7.6%. So that's even in the ones that ate a lot of meat. So we know that this is a healthy group of people. But those that avoided all animal products reduced their risk of type 2 diabetes by a massive 78%. Really impressive stuff. Why else is it a good idea? Because it feeds your microbiome. Now, everybody loves microbiome research. Well, in medical fields, I don't know if you know much about it otherwise, but I particularly love microbiome research because it's showing us the power not only of plants, not only of what we eat, but also in our relationship to our microbiome in our bodies, the mini universe contained within us. We are supposed to have billions of, of microbes inside us and on our skin that protect us that produce vitamins for us, that allow us to create neurotransmitters, that even create serotonin for us. The majority of serotonin, that feel-good neurotransmitter, is made by bacteria in the gut as long as we have beneficial gut bacteria. When we have a whole food plant-based diet, we are optimizing these beneficial gut bacteria. It's amazing. We're taking in foods that feed them directly. Prebiotics, we, we know probiotics means these gut bugs, right? Prebiotics are what feed these gut bugs. And what are prebiotics? Dietary fiber. How much dietary fiber do you get from animal products? Does anybody know? Zero. Everybody knows. <laughs> You're so good. Zero. You don't get any. So if you're having a whole food plant-based diet, pretty much everything you're eating will hopefully, unless it's complete junk food, be fantastic healthy fiber for your gut microbes. What happens is it gets into the tummy, um, into the large intestine. They break it down into short-chain fatty acids like butyrate. And these short-chain fatty acids are amazing. They draw cholesterol from our bloodstream that's not needed. They attach to our white blood cells, um, healing up the gut lining. They attach to receptors in our guts to tell us that we're full. And I said earlier about the serotonin and the vitamins that they make. They even make vitamin B12 for us, actually. So some of the B12 of the, that vegans need will actually be made by their microbes in their gut. But we can't rely on that. So I'm just curious, um, how many of you in this room are medical professionals of some sort? How many of you would see patients or clients in a medical capacity? A few? Oh, that's great. Okay, wonderful. Because this is really your chance to be their advocate. Um, this is your chance to provide them with accountability and enthusiasm. Because if you can show them the power of their diet, the power of their plate, they might actually begin to believe you. And they might actually change what they do day to day. If, as a medical professional, you say, oh, well, they're not going to listen, and, you know, I can't make a difference in 10 minutes. If you come at it with that mindset, I guarantee it's very difficult to have success. If you come at it with the mindset of being their advocate, helping them to help themselves, you will have a tremendously rewarding work life. I cannot overstate this enough. It will bring you happiness, and it will bring them empowerment. So it's really a win-win. And let me just quickly recap what you can achieve. Um, and this is for you guys all, because not only does diabetes affect many of us, but insulin resistance affects many more. Think about polycystic ovaries. Um, think about gestational diabetes. You know, all these things have insulin resistance and inflammation at their core. So if you can um, improve these things in yourselves, even if you're not diabetic, you will do great good for your body. But what can be achieved? As I mentioned before, type 1 diabetics can expect a potentially normal life expectancy, which is incredible. They can potentially reduce their insulin needs by two thirds and reduce their heart attack risk dramatically. Type 2s, you have to be careful. If you're medical professionals in this room and you casually recommend, oh, just go whole food plant-based, look it up online, you might find yourself 
in a situation with a patient where they've got severe hypoglycemia because they don't realize how fast their insulin sensitivity shoots up. They may still be taking the same amount of glycoside. They may still even be injecting insulin. You have to be so careful because they will re respond so quickly. So you have to tell them, this will change your blood sugars within days. You will need to considerably drop your medication requirements within days. So do warn them how effective and how incredible this can be. Um, and just quickly, because I did cover this earlier, but some of you may not have been at my earlier talk. People may have questions. So they might ask you, where do I get my protein from? Because people like to ask that question. And you can tell them, don't worry, it's okay. All the foods that you will eat contain protein, especially even fruits and vegetables. Everything will contain protein. But if you want particularly protein-rich sources, take a look at this list. You can even give them a picture like this. Take a picture. Tag me on Instagram if you think you want to. And um, yeah, they will, they will have plenty of protein in their diet. Um, and they'll also get a good chance of having enough fiber um, to feed those wonderful gut bugs. What about calcium? You can tell them again that calcium is very well absorbed if you're taking it from plants, but they will have to make sure they have a nice variety of whole food plant-based foods to get that calcium in their diet. Um, I like to tell them about Joel Furman's G-bombs. Hands up anyone who's familiar with G-bombs. Few of you, okay. I'm glad I brought this up then because I love the G-bombs. G-bombs, G, greens, B is beans, and that also includes chickpeas and lentils. O includes onions. Onions are fantastic, both raw and cooked. They give you different micronutrients when you cook them compared to when you don't. They contain alienases that are really beneficial. They're antioxidants, really good, super health food. Um, M for mushrooms. You have to cook mushrooms to get the best benefit, but they are a unique superfood. They're the only fungus people tend to eat and they are very healthy, so that's why they're in the G-bombs. B for berries, um, berries of all sorts, really healthy, lots of antioxidants and phytonutrients, so I would definitely recommend that on the list. And S for seeds. This doesn't cover every kind of healthy food group, but it's just a nice introduction for people if they want to know, okay, well, what kind of things do I need to remember? You can say G-bombs and then it, it, it just helps them to recall the kinds of food they should have more of each day. I particularly am a big fan of flax and chia seeds because they contain short-chain omega-3 fatty acids and um, they have tremendous effects on blood pressure control. I would say having two tablespoons of flax seeds a day is as effective, if not more effective, than a blood pressure lowering medication. I've seen it work in my practice time and time again. They might ask you, what do I eat? What can I eat? And I'll say, you can eat everything. You just have to know what to do with it. So if you're in a position to give them some advice, you can say, look, these are some great breakfast ideas. These are power pancakes. My husband makes these. They are available on my Instagram page as a recipe if you want to know. It's dead simple. Porridge, mixed up with the seeds I talked about earlier, breakfast smoothies, lunch ideas. Remember, we're talking whole food plant-based, so um, you're going to be having lots in the way of whole grains, um, fresh whole foods and plant foods. Dinner ideas, simple switches. I, I introduced this concept in the last talk, but if somebody loves a particular food type, it's really nice to be able to provide them with an idea for an alternative so they can imagine what that might look like in their lives. Um, this is a lentil bolognese. You've got a roast dinner. For those of you who love just meat and two veg or for people, relatives, maybe someone who's of a generation that just love the meat and two veg, you could give them some nice ideas for roast dinners, um, curries, chilies, all of that kind of thing. Snacks, you know, it can be so easy. This particular chocolate mousse I love, and it's all whole food plant-based um, using avocados. I guess you guys are all very familiar with the joys of avocados. Um, eating out used to be a big challenge, but not so much anymore. You can get all sorts of delicious whole food plant-based options, but you do have to ask for specific menus and you just have to be mindful of added oils, which can be a problem sometimes. So if you're being strict for reasons of heart disease or for autoimmune disorders, then eating out may still sometimes be a little bit of a challenge. But for those of you who want to help relatives that have mild diabetes, it, it really won't matter and they can enjoy all these whole food plant-based meals and still have excellent 
insulin sensitivity. So briefly, complete optimization. For people who are on a whole food plant-based diet, I would say, please do take your vitamin B12. I'm gonna repeat myself because some of you weren't here earlier. B12 is made by microbes in the soil. Many of us don't get enough of it, including meat eaters, especially if they're over the age of 50, and diabetics, very much so, because they will usually be taking metformin. Metformin is known to interrupt your ability to absorb B12 from the stomach. And so do proton pump inhibitors like omeprazole or lansoprazole. So if you know anybody on those, uh, on those medications, then they're going to really struggle to absorb their B12, whether they eat meat or whether they don't. So I like to recommend a spray, particularly in the methylcobalamin form, because it's more bioavailable and because you can absorb it through your tongue. You don't have to worry about absorbing it through your stomach. It's just done. Vitamin D3 um, comes in many vegan sources now, and I'd recommend that um, because many of us don't get enough sunlight, and it's important to make sure we have enough vitamin D. Sunlight is the optimal way of getting it, by the way, because it's a hormone you synthesize through your skin. I would say try and get some sunlight for your optimization, but it's pretty hard in the UK, and so that's why I would always say supplement just in case. And lastly, EPA, DHA supplementation. Omega-3 fatty acids are really important for brain and heart health. You can make these yourself and you can get, as I said before, you can get short chain fatty acids, um, omega-3 fatty acids from flax seeds, chia seeds, um, walnuts, hemp seeds, and you can make the long chains yourself. So you don't need to worry too much, but I would say if you're diabetic, if you're elderly, if you're pregnant, if you're a child, in my opinion, it would be lovely to be able to give you the, the long chain omega-3 fatty acids ready made. And where do you get those from? You get them from the ocean. That's where the fish get them from anyway. Fish may not be great at that short chain to long chain conversion either, but they're swimming in the ocean all day, they're gulping on algae. Algae is the original plant form of these long chain omega-3 fatty acids. It's really amazing if you think about it. So. Why not go directly to the source, take your algae supplement, your EPA DHA supplement, and you don't have to worry about all of the heavy metals and the PCBs and the dioxins that are concentrated in the fish muscle and in the fish liver, because you're taking it from the purest source. Um, so that would be my recommendation. What about diabetics who want a little bit more help? I would strongly recommend these two books. I've mentioned Joel Furman before. He is a physician in the US who has a dietary philosophy called the Nutritarian Diet. And what he says is that essentially you want to get the maximum nutrients from your food whilst eating the minimal macronutrients. So essentially optimizing all of the micronutrients with the minimum calories. And he has a tremendous body of work behind him. Also, Dr. Neil Bernard of the Physicians Committee. You may be familiar with Dr. Bernard. He is truly inspirational, and he's done many studies on diabetic patients now to show the benefits of plant-based nutrition. Both of these books give you very clear guidance on how to do it yourself, and so I would thoroughly recommend one or other, or even both, if someone's keen, so that they can understand how to implement this in their own lives. What if someone isn't much of a reader? Maybe they want to have something online. I would recommend the Mastering Diabetes course. This is run by two American type 1 diabetics, uh, Cyrus, Dr. Cyrus Kambata and Robbie Barbaro. And Dr. Cyrus Kambata is a PhD in insulin resistance. He knows everything about the cellular biology of diabetes. And he and his partner both strongly endorse a whole food plant-based approach to treat and cure type 2 diabetes. They incidentally live this lifestyle as well. They're both type 1s. They have minimal insulin requirements, which means that they will also have a hopefully normal life expectancy. So I would like to just ask you, what do we do now? What can you do for your friends, for your family, for yourselves? Um, well, you can follow me on Instagram or Facebook if you want to know more about diabetes and general whole food plant-based nutrition. But the first step, really, if you want to know more about the references I talked about today, please do email me. I'd be more than happy to reply to any emails. I'm going to send you all the references. You can look all of this up yourself, and then you will have a deeper understanding of all of the concepts that I've introduced today. So that's gemmanewman at doctors.org.uk. 
Try it for yourself. Many of you are probably already vegan, but maybe not all of you are whole food plant-based. Why not try it? A 21-day trial, see how you feel, see if you notice any health improvements, but it's only really by trying it out can you be confident to be able to recommend it to other people, uh, and so that would be a great step. Lastly, why not recommend it to a friend? You've got nothing to lose and they've got everything to gain. Because we all are familiar with this story of loss. I think all of us have lost people before their time from chronic diseases. And in recommending certain plant-based nutrition principles, then you have the chance to essentially change um, these stories of loss and heartbreak and you have the chance to change your own story and then be the hero of your own story as well as helping somebody else. So that's where I draw this talk to a close. Thank you so, so much.